Hello everyone and welcome to Art Starts Explores. My name is Kay Slater and I am the gallery coordinator and preparator at Art Starts in Schools. Welcome to a new month of Explorers. This month we're going to be exploring maps and this is week one of the three weeks of workshops that we're going to explore through together. I wanted to take a quick note before we got started because one of the important rules of Explorers is about respect. And so this week's theme of maps, um, you've probably seen a map You've probably used a map or you've uh, you've been with somebody who's used a map before but i wanted to acknowledge that maps the act of mapping or writing down a map is is actually a colonial tool it was um it was a reason for people to go and invade or explore land that wasn't necessarily their own for the sake of conquest, for the sake of completing a map, um, and for, for some, especially for many indigenous people uh, around, the, uh, around the earth, um, maps are actually a sign or a, a signal of a, of a past um, where people came and invaded or took land from them. And so uh, with all explorers, with all art making, it's important that we acknowledge history. Um, and even when it's uncomfortable or uh, we, we know it's bad or it's wrong, it's better to acknowledge it, to understand it, to learn about it, than to ignore it or bury it because it's uncomfortable. So uh, I just wanted to have that in mind as we explore together the next couple of weeks about what, uh, what maps are, what they can do, and what they mean to us now, um, especially here on Turtle Island or where I'm coming to you from the, uh, stolen, the stolen territory of the tsleil the Squamish, and the Musqueam people. So you've probably used a map in real life um, for the purposes of wayfinding, or uh, navigation, you get into your car, or um, you're going for a walk and you need to figure out how to arrive at a friend's place, or you're starting a new school and you need to figure out the best route to get there. Um, but for this week, I thought we'd actually, we'd take the real world and we'd put it to the side because those maps, they already exist. We've, we, we've probably used those before. And so for week one, I thought what we could do is we could explore making our own fantasy world. Oh, I already wrote the sticky. And so we're gonna build our own world and we're gonna prototype that world by playing with maps. Okay, I'm gonna put these stickies to the side. There we go, make a little bit more room. So yeah, we're gonna be building our own world. Before we get started, here are some of the tools that I thought we could use to explore. You can use whatever tools you want when you're making uh, wherever you are making. But uh, I want to suggest that if you have some paper and it doesn't have to be clean paper, it doesn't have to be fresh paper with no marks on it, it doesn't have to be um, eight and a half by 11 from a printer. Um, I got these out of the recycling bin. Um, and for exploring, remember nothing is for keeps. So using recycled paper is great. A mark making tool. So a mark making tool is anything that makes a mark. So that could be markers. And I always use markers because it's a little easier for you to see on my layout. But I love using crayons and pencil crayons. Even just pencils and pens are, are great for this exploring. I also have you see this dotted line down here. These are things that I was thinking I might try using but you might not have available. And that's okay. There's lots of ways that we can explore today with just mark making and paper. But I was thinking maybe if you had a board game um, with some ready-mades, because these kind of tokens can be really great to mark a space or mark an area and can be moved around. And so if you have a board game, even if you have some Lego, any kind of ready-made 
that you have a bunch of that you can place on a piece of paper could be something that you might want to use while we explore today. And then lastly, it's scissors. And I decided I would put that there because some people don't like ripping paper as much as I do. But whenever there's a chance for me to rip paper, I'm going to rip paper. Okay. So when we're looking at uh, building our own world, when I'm talking about building a map for prototyping, what we can do is, is we can start thinking about what is on our fantasy world. And so even though the earth is a sphere, is a circle, right? The map that we sometimes see in two dimension or on a flat piece of paper, they've taken the globe and they've kind of split it out into pieces and then used math so that you can see all the pieces of the earth kind of flattened out. And that's why sometimes or often um, some of the places towards the poles, so at the, the top and the bottom of the globe are actually blown up. Um, and that's, and that's, uh, that's so that there isn't like a black line for the spaces because if you divide up a, um, a circle, it doesn't exactly translate. You see my fingers are kind of spreading out. So the space between my fingers would be black. So they fill that in by kind of um, expanding the, um, the different continents. Um, and so we don't have to think about that because maybe our new world is flat, right? We can really go as deep as we want when we create our own world. We're not constrained. We're not fixed. We don't have to use a world, a fantasy world that is on a round planet. Why couldn't it be flat? Why couldn't it be donut shaped? Why couldn't it be a bowl? We really can think of whatever shape we want. My world, for the sake of just drawing a map, I think I'm going to just think about it as a flat surface. But if you wanted to sit and think about different shapes a world could be, that might influence how you draw your map. The next thing that we want to do is we want to think about different um, landscapes or the different um, kinds of uh, a weather or terrain land that, um, that are on your world. And so if you've ever read a book where there's a map at the beginning, you might notice that they'll put um, areas in here. I'm just going to start drawing because I can and I can rip it up and I can move it around when I'm finished. But maybe um, this, this area is where our story takes place. And so they've actually cut out maybe some of the larger part of the area, a part of the, um, the land, because for the story, we really only care about this section of the earth, or, or sorry, of the planet, of the, of the land, of the fantasy land. And maybe this is water over here. I'm using squiggly lines. Oh. There we go. I'm using squiggly lines to express the water, right? These aren't really waves. They look more like W's and squiggles. But once you've seen this often enough, you start to recognize, you start to associate water with these kind of symbols. And so the more uh, maps you look at, the more of these kind of icons that you can steal, um, that you can use when you're creating your own map. Um, but you could create your own. Maybe water on your world doesn't have waves. Maybe water on your world is all frozen and you want to show your water in lines. And you get to decide, right? You get to be the map maker. You get to create your own legend, which is a way of reading the symbols on a map. So however you wanted to do it, how else could we express? Maybe, oh, maybe you have um, lava. And so maybe your water is nothing but fire. You do little fire symbols, right? Whatever you want to, to do in there. 
maybe in my world, this, maybe there's frozen, frozen water over here. And then all of a sudden there's great steam right here and it turns into fire. Interesting world. That's something else that's really cool about thinking and dreaming about our own fantasy world is that the rules or even um, science and uh, math don't necessarily have, have to be true or real in your fantasy land. And so while when you're, when you're mapping or when you're um, learning about the world and geography in school, they'll tell you that um, certain bodies of water um, will only have certain kind of fish or um, certain areas that are drier um, only have certain kind of rain patterns or water patterns or, or whatever it's going to be. Um, but in your world, you can decide that maybe there isn't gravity or maybe because the water is different, um, you don't get rainfall. Maybe you only get pudding that falls from the sky, right? There are, the only rules are the rules that you make for this fantasy world. And you can reflect that in your map. I really like that pudding idea. So I've decided that this land, so there's two land masses on this area of my map that I've decided to focus on that we're getting really, really close to. And this is, this is one way of starting to build your world is that you can think about just like that storybook of just one space, one close area and define that first because you can use a bunch of different pieces of recycled paper and continue to build out as you go. And so I really like that pudding idea and I've decided that this right here beside my ice lake is the Valley of Pudding. <laughs> and I've done a bunch of dots here, but pudding isn't really dots. So right now I'm just, you know what, I'm just gonna define it like that. And then I'm gonna take one of my pieces of paper and I'm gonna rip off a little section because I'm just playing as I go along so I can remember. And I'm gonna write pudding. Maybe a little arrow there. And that's just to remind me as I'm building that this is where the pudding is. And I might come up with a different symbol as I go along that will be better. Or maybe I wanna color this in later when I'm using different colors. Okay, so this is my valley of pudding. So ice and pudding, what would be around, what would be around my valley of pudding? Maybe there is a forest. You know what, because I'm going with this kind of sweet, weird lake here, maybe there is a forest of banana trees. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking a shape, so like a palm tree, or a banana tree, right? The trees that uh, plantains grow on, and then the bananas over there to the side. And I'm doing a small version. So I'm taking this information and even this drawing is, is a approximation, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a perfect representation. It's an abstraction. It's a simplification of a plantain tree. And so if we were to actually draw even, even this, you know, is not photorealistic, but maybe a plantain tree, you know, it's got a bit more sinew or more um, fibrous texture along the, the trunk, and then there's the kind of furry bits. I don't, I don't actually know the, the names of the pieces of a, of a plantain tree, but that's something I can go and research at another time. That's exciting, I'll, I'll check that out later. Oh, it ends up looking pretty close. Because I don't actually know what, um, what plantain trees look like um, in detail, I'm not actually doing a very accurate representation and I'm kind of stereotyping my knowledge um, and putting it onto this onto this picture, which is another reason why um, maps can be can be tricky, right? Because a symbol can represent a whole bunch of things, and it doesn't really give you any kind of depth of information. It doesn't give you um, information about the earth that the the trees are growing in, or the people that cultivate. Um, and so there's there's a little bit of an erasure a little bit of uh, ignoring or erasing that happens because we're trying to translate a whole bunch of information 
into a simplified visual representation of of a place um and so a map is a tool but it's not a very deep tool and um because you know scale size of things like this is not the size of a tree this is not the size of a tree but this size of a tree relative to this size of water might be you know might might be accurate but at the same time maybe it's just this whole huge area these are all trees and so the trees wouldn't be that big but for our eyes rather than drawing the trees this size and nobody really being able to understand what those trees are by making them a little bit larger we can express or we can share that this area is populated by these kind of shapes of trees. So there's all these tricks that we're doing. And as you're playing and designing your own, uh, your own map, you can, you can kind of guess or figure or, or just try and see, you know, if you wanted a forest in, area, in an area, how many trees do you have to draw before it's really clear that an area is a forest? What if you only drew one tree? Would there be a way for you to express one section of your fantasy world, of your fantasy map, by just drawing one tree? Let's try it. I think one way of doing it would be to maybe draw the shape of the tree that is in that area. And so I've got a coniferous tree, coniferous tree over here. And then maybe doing, so that's the area here. And so a border, by doing a border, I've let that symbol represent everything in that area. But we could also use color. I don't even need to color in that whole area because by again using the outline and using the color to code that area, to represent that area, I've made a connection, I've made a link between that defined area and that tree. And so that shows that everything in that area is uh, is the same is is made up of those kind of trees and so i don't necessarily have to do it how else could you do it what if the trees in this area are also um coniferous but uh, i don't want to draw or maybe i don't have as much room for this maybe it's just a little area here i could simplify the tree even more you ever seen a toy like that where it's um where it's a triangle with a little base down here. It's kind of like a Christmas tree, right? And so because we understand that this map, that the map is representing land, that this probably doesn't mean triangle area. I mean, it could, but it probably means a tree because we recognize that shape as being similar or a simplification of that, which is of course a simplification of a really detailed pine needle tree, right? And so it's just, we're continuing to abstract or simplify down so that the shape can represent something and then the shape represents an area based on the information that we give someone. So even when we're, draw when we're drawing any picture, we're drawing a portrait or we're drawing a picture of a toy, the details we include and the details that we don't include all tell part of the story. They're all part of the narrative of the visual story. So uh, I'm not even going to do a black border this time, but I'm going to show using green again, you know, because that's, again, a color that most people understand being um, connected with trees. 
And this time, instead of coloring in the icon, I'm going to color in all the area that that tree represents or where that forest is. And so by not coloring that in, I put some contrast. I made it so that it was easy for you to see the shape there. And then I colored in the area rather than outlining, I colored in where that tree is going to be. I think I'm going to do that one more time. Only I think I have another thing here. Yeah. Okay. So this was the area. Oh, you know what? I want a pudding. I want a pudding color too. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I feel better about my valley of pudding. And I guess it's maybe a chocolate pudding or caramel pudding. There you go. I feel like that was better representing pudding than the dots. I don't need to get rid of the dots though. This is just a prototype. This is just us playing and trying around or trying things out. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use texture. So I've got these trees here. I don't want to color it in because I've already tried that over there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to draw some grassy land here. I'm going to draw it on both sides of the tree. Maybe I'll go into the pudding a little bit over along the edge. I'm not being, I'm not being very careful. I'm not drawing every single line carefully because at this point we're just, we're just trying things out, right? You know what? I'm going to move my pudding sign over because now I've, I've colored this in and that's a little bit clearer. And there we go. So I use texture to define that area. All right, let's fill in a couple more um, areas here. You know what? I think that even though uh, the, the, you know, the uh, forest extends basically along here, you know what? I think I want that to keep going. Where is my other marker? I think that's the one I used. I'm going to make it so that this tree area is all along the water's edge because I get to decide and you get to decide as well for your fantasy land, right? You're making your rules. Well, you get to be the one that says, well, this is where the forest is because I say it is. And if you're making with somebody else and they're making something, then they get to say, well, this is where it is. And even if it isn't what you would do, that's okay. You can add what you would do to your map, or even if you're not drawing, if you're just thinking about a fantasy world, the rules you get to set, but when somebody else is making the rules, they get to set their fantasy rules because it's their fantasy. It's their exploration. It's their art. Okay, so I've gone along here and what I wanted to do was I wanted to take this marker and I wanted to show that this is all grassland. So maybe farms, um, maybe wild fields, um, tall grasses, um, wildflowers. So it's, it's uh, not cultivated land and there, there isn't really a forest here. So grasslands here. But I've only got three colors of green. And so rather than going out and trying to find a whole nother color of green, I'm going to use a green that I've used before. And again, I'm going to use texture. And maybe it's grassland and I had grass here. How can I show that this is grass as well without making it seem like this grass is exactly the same as this grass? Well, the way that I think I'm going to try is, is that the squiggles or the kind of grass texture that I added in here were about this long. So what I'm going to do now is I'm either going to go bigger or smaller. It still kind of looks like grass because it's a simplification, right? It really, in actual fact, it's just a scribble, right? That's all it really is, is a scribble. And so it's the context or the fact that we're working in a map 
that allows us to look at a scribble and go, I know what that means. If we just saw the scribble by itself, we wouldn't necessarily know that it meant grass. We have other clues, like the fact that I used green, but maybe in your fantasy land, the grass is all red. And so how could you express it when you're talking to other humans, when you're talking to other people who understand these kind of symbols, but to um, also share how it's different? And so by using the shape of grass and then changing the color, you're only changing one thing and it's easier for most people to go, oh, I understand because there's uh, things in common. There's a link to something that they understand or they've seen before. But I don't have green grass or uh, red grass in my land. I have green grass. And over here, I'm going to show that this is grasslands by just those little squiggles. I'm kind of spreading them out. It doesn't have to be everywhere. If you wanted to take the time, and it can be really relaxing to do this, if you wanted to take the time and just fill in the whole area with texture, you absolutely could. But I feel like I'm getting my point across by just having a couple of squiggles. And because uh, I wanted to try something, something different, and this is just my play, I think I'm also just going to show that this was grassland over here. So this is, this is the same kind of terrain, the same kind of land. And um, if the water was really this big, and this was a whole big, huge forest, we think of how big a tree is, like this is a really big area. And so I just want to take a, a moment to go that even though um, the weather may be the same or the grass may look the same from one area to the next, that land is different. And so land that is separated by a really far distance over here, we don't have any information other than looks that these are the same. We don't know the people who are here. We don't know what kind of things they grow, what they eat. The animals. We can assume that there are probably similar kinds of animals or simil similar kind of looking humans, but we don't know anything about them. And so this is what, this is just to revise again or to go back to review what I was saying earlier about how a map is a simplification. We don't have all the information. And so a lot of assumptions happen. Okay. Two more things because I said I had lava and I've already brought color into my map. And so I'm going to do the same thing up here. I want to show that this is lava. What does yours look like? What kind of interesting things do you have? And you know what? Your, your fantasy map, your fantasy world can be really interesting even if it looks very similar to earth to to the world that we have now and so maybe you don't have a lake of fire and maybe you don't have fantasy creatures maybe it just looks like another version of earth where you're imagining different things maybe it's just that the land masses the continents look different where the water is is in a different place um maybe it's got all these the same thing so like there's an ocean um, but maybe there's only one ocean on your planet, or maybe there's seven oceans on your planet, or maybe the whole planet is oceans. You don't have to have any fantastical creatures that we don't have here. It could be a world where it's just oceans and fish and the same kind of fish we have here. It's a fantasy because that's not what we have here. And it's something that you came up with in your head. Okay, uh, I said that this was ice. Mm, what do I have here? Okay, I have this kind of light color. I'm going to show that this is ice by uh, not coloring in the whole thing. So kind of like the shine that happens on ice. So like the light reflecting on ice. There we go. Okay. I don't need my white. 
So there is one section of my fantasy land. And so I use color um, and I use symbols to define this area. But I want to make sure that people um, know the names of these areas. And so I could try and get a pencil or a pen and write really small in some of these areas, but it might be difficult. And so we're going to do something called the legend. You know what, this is a good time to talk about, again, uh, going back to um, maps, especially as a colonial tool. Um, if you think about the, the um, especially in the Western world, about how, um, how people from Europe were going out into the world to try and expand their maps, if they didn't have a lot of information about other land masses, they wouldn't necessarily need to draw those land masses at an accurate size because they didn't have to fit as much information into those spaces. Here, I want to give you an example of what I mean before, I, before we look at legends. So I'm going to go back to my black. So um, pretending this is going to be a very bad version or shape, but, but here's, here's Europe. <laughs> oh my goodness. And then um, we've got all the other all the other land masses around it. Oh, go around. And then oh gosh. And then South America. Okay. As I said, this is a really bad representation. But what I what I was trying to get at is is that um, the people who live in this area, or more specifically, this area here don't have any information about the rest of it. But in this little section here, they need to fit their water and their roads and the little uh, towns and um, important places and their palaces. And all of a sudden, there's no room for them to be able to fit all that information there. And so, because that was what they knew, having those areas be larger and so that they're not necessarily representational or, or um, they don't necessarily have the right relationship relative to the size of the other things, they blow it up because they have so much more information that they want to write down. And this is, this is me just drawing in Sharpie, but like I have no place to actually write um, town names and water names and um, landmarks, right? So that's kind of the idea when you see a map um, that is uh, blown up in different proportions, they're usually trying to translate. Remember how I was talking about simplification? They're trying to express information by changing the size um, and also by pushing things that they see as less important or that they are ignorant to or that they don't have the information about um, so that they have more space to take up for the things that they think are important. And so it's not that it's inherently wrong for you to make more space so that you can have more information, but being respectful and acknowledging the purpose of any of these things. So the purpose of doing that larger or that change or that manipulation for information doesn't mean that you could or that you should go out and say, this is an accurate map. This is how the world actually is. Okay, so that was real world stuff. I said I wasn't going to get into this, but that whole idea of having a small amount of space to put lots and lots of information, we've kind of come up with a way around that by going, okay, well, we're going to zoom in. We're going to get really close. We're going to take a micro lens and we're going to come in and maybe our world is really huge, but we're going to focus down on just this one area where these two continents meet at the, at the, um, at the combination of the river of fire or the ocean of fire or whatever we want to name this and the lake of ice. And so that's one way is that you can have lots of different maps that are really close up. So you have lots of information. 
there are also some some things called legends and that's where i was going uh before i kind of went off on a tangent here but that's all part of exploring maps right we don't have to stay on one thing all the time we can stop and think we can have a discussion with other people with the people that we're making with and ask them what they think or what they know or different lands that they've been to maybe they've traveled places and seen different terrain trees or areas that you haven't and then they can or um you can build some of their experiences into your fantasy world. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to pick out some of the icons, the iconic, the, uh, the symbols that I've put around here, and I'm going to write down information beside it. And so what are some of the things that I see when I'm looking at my map? Now I'm going to read the map that I drew. And so remember how I put those dots there before? And I was like, well, that's not really what pudding looks like. What's cool about me using the dots is that I didn't use the dots anywhere else. So if I was to put on a separate piece of paper or a little area of my map, if this was a bigger map and I drew out a little space for it, my legend could have dots. And without even having to use color, Somebody could look around the map and go, oh, well, that's where the dots are. So probably whatever information I'm going to put here has to do with these dots. And so I'm going to go, did I call that the Valley of Pudding? You know what? It, that's what it is now. I know that it was pudding. I couldn't remember what I called it, but I'm going to call it Valley of Pudding. There we go. And so that legend, and I could put a square around it if I want, but I'm not going to right now. Um, people look for that dot, they look on my map. Ah, so they can now go, uh, because of the connection of the symbols, this is the Valley of Pudding. Great. Okay, let's keep going. What are some other icons we see? Well, I'm not going to name these because they don't have a name. The peoples who live there decided not to name the land it's the land that they roam and naming it or, or laying claim to it is not important. They just, uh, they live um, in connection with the land. Um, and, and in my fantasy world, the people who live there don't have a, a name for these lands. And so, or maybe even just the people who are reading or the people who wrote this map, right? Now, when we're thinking about building our world, our fantasy world, Maybe it's just the people who like to make maps, or maybe the people who live, and I'm going to put a little dot here. Maybe this is where, um, where most of the people, the humans on this world live. And so maybe they don't go out very often, or maybe this is all detailed here because they've traveled and visited all these places. They haven't visited here and they have no information. And so they haven't named that yet. And so I'm going to go grassland. Okay, what else? I ripped off just a corner. I'm going to keep using this big piece of paper. What else do we see? Well, for the um, the plantain fields, the area where the um, the banana trees are growing, or whatever I decide, maybe, you know, I've used these palm tree shapes, and I keep saying bananas, but maybe on your world, um, they grow pananas, or trananas, or grananas, or apples, or whatever you want, right? You could come up with your own thing. And as you're building your world, if you come up with some of these ideas, you can write them down for later on. So whether or not you're just gonna have it be a map, maybe you're gonna build a story out of this, this fantasy world that you're building. You're gonna write a story or you're gonna draw a comic book. Maybe you're gonna run a game on on this land maybe you're going to build a board game so when you're prototyping when you're coming up with these ideas and you come up with something fun or interesting or something that you don't necessarily need represented on your map you could go you know i've just done a quick symbol of my of my uh, palm tree again 
and I've gone bananas because I thought that was funny and I wanted I wanted this to be a field where grananas are uh, are grown um, or maybe they're born maybe the trees ooh, maybe the trees are sentient maybe the trees actually are like are like humans they have brains they can think they can make decisions in this world um, and then I can be like do they move? Do they talk? And I can ask those questions as I go along and that can be fun as I continue to build out my world. And I'm gonna put it to the side because I don't need to answer that question right now, but I don't wanna forget about it as I'm playing and I'm coming up with this world. And remember for this one, because we're just exploring maps and it's not necessarily for keeps, this can just be a game that you play to see how many words, worlds you can come up with. If you're making with a friend, you could each come up with your own rules or your own worlds. Tell them to each other. Explain the rules or what's different. Compare the different worlds and then throw them away. And then the next time you get together and you play this game, you can see how much you remembered or what stuck with you because you actually really liked those things and forget the things you didn't. You could blend the two worlds together that you both made into one world that you make uh, together. And so this is part of um, exploring and when we don't keep things is that we have the opportunity later when we come back and we do decide to make something for keeps that we've already practiced and tried out things and we can pick and choose from the things that we like and leave behind the things that we didn't like. So what else do I see? I see, oh, sorry, I haven't finished the granana trees yet. So, granananas. There's my, whew, there's my fast <laughs> palm tree. And I'm gonna go granana fields. I don't have any other information about that. I don't know if they were planted they were wild, there are people who live there. All I have is that that's what that means, is that that's the granana fields. Okay, what else do I have? I have the fire icon, and I could go ocean of lava, um, and then I can go maybe those lines right? Because I've got some hash marks there. And that's the only place where I've got the hash marks. And I can go Great Lake of Ice. And you might have names for these things. If you, if you uh, start coming up with fantasy characters that are here or animals, maybe, maybe this land has sentient giraffes, and they are, um, they are tyrants of this world and they are maybe they're a monarchy and they all wear crowns and maybe um this great lake of fire is named after one of the giraffe kings of this fantasy world um, and maybe that giraffe king's name was spiky because <laughs> why not and so may maybe this is the great lake spiky because um if you think about uh, especially um, in the, co uh, the colonized world, uh, a lot of places are named by people that uh, conquered them or said they discovered them. Um, so depending on the story that you create, um, when you assign names to things, um, it will also tell a story of um, the people and how um, the beings or the creatures dominate or put their mark on different land masses or different um, different uh, terrain on your map. Right now, I'm just basically naming what my sentient giraffes have come to know about the world. I like the sentient giraffe, but I think I want to leave out um, colonial names off of my map right now because that's the fantasy world that I have, and I don't want that. Um, what else do I have? Okay, I've got these trees over here. And then I had that giant coniferous tree. And then I have the, the kind of weird eye. Okay. 
And so uh, this one's going to be uh, uh, how about just tall forest because that's what the sentient giraffes have started naming it. That's the tall forest. Actually, I feel like this should have been the tall forest and that's the short forest. And I can do that. I can just scribble it out because I'm just using scrap paper. I'm just trying things out. Short forest, tall forest. And I'm gonna call this Laffy Town <laughs> because of the two Fs in giraffe. Because <laughs> <So laughs> art making should be fun. If we're making something up um, and we're coming up with our own world, you can be silly. You might be doing something really serious because you are planning a book or a story or a comic book. But if you're just playing, you really can't. I, I mean, I could have called this the Forest of K and K Lake and K Fire Lake and K Forest One, right? Because it's just my world. This is something that I am playing with and I get to make all of the decisions. And this is fun and this is harmless and this is just something that I get to try out. And same with you as you're exploring your map, you really can do whatever you want um, and, and try out how it makes you feel when you try these different things. If you name a town after you, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel proud? Does it make you feel weird? Does it make you um, think about your name? Does it make you think about what you would have to do to have a town named after you? There's so many things that you could be thinking about and playing with as you build a fantasy world. Okay, so there's just one more thing that I wanted us to explore and you can keep going. Um, you can get really deep. You could build this out. You could add more pieces of paper and keep going. You could draw on what the land looks like down here. Eventually you could have a whole uh, table full of paper that you've drawn all these different areas of your map. And then maybe you draw another map where you draw everything that you can see here in small. And then you've got close up or zoomed in portions of your map. And then one macro or wide view of your map. You could staple them all together and then you have the different pages of your map. If you're building a, a book, um, oh, sorry, a, like a, a journal, of information for a book or for a story or for a game later. You could keep some of these things, staple them together, and then they're a reference for you to go back and go, what was that idea I had? Oh, right. But that's not what we're doing today. Everything we're doing today, at least uh, for what I'm doing, is gonna get thrown out because that's what I'm doing for Explorers. Um, and any idea I have, I could always take a picture. I'm taking a video of what I'm doing right now so I can look back at some of these ideas. Um, but it can be really fun to just start again um, from scratch and see what comes up next time. Okay, so I went off on a tangent again. Um, what I wanted to say was I said that if you had any toys or ready-mades um, or game pieces that you could bring those into your art making as well. And so I have a bunch of these little uh, wooden cubes here. Um, I have a I, um, in my studio, my, my partner has a, um, a game building kit. And so for prototyping, for um, coming up with um, board games or storytelling devices, um, there's a whole bunch of different tools in this cool kit that we have. And so it's got different kinds of dice and it's got um, different kinds of markers. So like uh, game markers and uh, shapes. And so um, that's cool that I have access to that, but you might have um, a board game that has little characters in it or that has um, um, shapes that you want to use. The only thing that's important about that, especially when we're, respect we're respecting our making, is that we put it back, right? Because there's nothing, there's nothing more frustrating when you go to sit down and play a board game and the pieces are missing. So we want to make sure that we're really careful. Um, and if we're going to take something out of one section or one area or one box, we're going to put it back when we're all finished. 
So I have these cubes. And so I've already kind of made a part of my map. And so I could play around and I could, I could assign meaning to any of these cubes. So uh, one way that I could do it is I could decide that all the yellow pieces are where towns are. And so maybe this is the capital, Laffy, Laffy Town is the capital of this area, but maybe there's um, you know, a camp there or a settlement there or another town there or a community there or whatever. So however I wanted to find these, these blocks, I could do that. I could move them around. I could, as I'm telling my story, as I'm writing my story, as I'm building um, my comic book, um, maybe the main character is here. Maybe there's some kind of conflict. And so as I move the character around the board, when they come up against another group, Maybe this is an opportunity. And remember, conflict doesn't always have to be bad. So maybe when this red cube meets meets this uh, yellow cube, this yellow cube is angry um, that this red cube has approached it, but maybe there's an opportunity for them to have a conversation or for them to trade information or for them to learn from each other um, and to get over any kind of initial prejudice that they had. And so that's when I'm talking about conflict is that um, maybe in meeting, Everything isn't happy and good right at the beginning, but after some communication and the ability to listen to each other, um, they can resolve that conflict. And so that's, or maybe there are fights. Maybe it is about um, this red cube has made people angry or this red cube is going and they, they are fighting. So a lot of games, um, especially um, video games, but like, because you can use this kind of map to come up with your video game prototype. If you wanted to build a video game, you could totally make your map and your character. These could be goals, right? So for the video game that you're going to be building, these are goals and places that people have to get to. Maybe there are secret goals that you can plan. And so then when you've got your prototype, when you've got this here, you can go, okay, well, what, what is the path that my red cube has to take to get to all these, these places? How are they going to get across the the lake of ice why would they ever get over to this secret area do i need to put maybe something over here that it would encourage them to go over there and you can ask all these questions while you're playing with your fantasy map maybe you're not building a video game from scratch maybe you're modding a video game so maybe you're building a skin or a level um, and you're able to do your own version a lot of video games let you do that now. Um, you could take symbols or you could take, um, you could even print out a map that maybe the game gives you and then do this on top of the map while you're making your decisions about how you would build your level. And so maps are just a great kind of canvas for you to be able to use to um, have symbols and um, icons of people or units or individuals or objects um, that you can then move around and uh, ask questions as you're doing your planning. For a board game, um, you might also decide a path that you're going to uh, have people go along. And so maybe the starting area is here I'm going to draw a big star here. So this is where characters start. But on my prototype here, I'm going to just draw because I'm just trying things out. And maybe the path goes like Maybe that's the path that I want them to take. Maybe there's a side path where you can go the other direction, but we have to actually go around here. And to make that a little bit clearer for you to be able to see, because the black kind of disappears here, I'm going to color in the path in orange. Because I'm just trying things out. It doesn't have to be beautiful and perfect. I don't have to color in the lines. Also, any excuse to use orange. Orange is my favorite color. So. 
wasn't enough orange on this mat. <laughs> there we go. So maybe that's the path that my board game is going to take. And maybe I want one, two, three, four, five, six, seven steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And then as I'm planning out my board game, so this is where the legend can come up again. So maybe those are the different areas here, but maybe I've got another piece of paper that as I plan out this game, maybe I'll go grab some dice and I can, I can move uh, my characters along here. And I can, you know, in my fantasy world, when you are making rules, you can go, uh, when characters are on ice, lose one turn, right? And so you can come up with these ideas as you're going along and go, okay, that makes sense. And maybe they have to wait, then I'll roll and go, oh, no, that, that they're able to roll a six and they're able to get past there. No, that's too easy. I want to add more boxes in between that they have to go to because I always want them to have to move slower when they go over water. Um, and so you can make these decisions on your little prototype um, before you start making something for keeps. There are lots of different ways that you can explore building your own world and I've just explored a few of them. Um, if you did something really cool that I didn't think about at home I or wherever you were making, um, I would love to hear about it. You can always comment on any of our videos on Facebook, on YouTube, or at artstarts.com slash explores dash online. This was just week one of maps. We have two more weeks of uh, map making together map exploration. And um, all of those videos will be archived online. You can always come back and rewatch this video, watch it with uh, friends or another grown up when you're making again in the future um, and then um, in the, the following weeks those will all be posted online as well. I'm going to leave the camera running for a little bit longer as I always like to do because cleaning up is so much a part of Art Stars Explorers and expressing respect um, but thank you so much for joining me this week and I can't wait to keep making with you next week.